Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the most disturbing painting in the world. It is brutal, violent, and sublime. It's Saturn Devouring His Sun, created by Francisco Goya. It is the perfect painting for that it is the most sublime work in art history. First, we are going to look at Goya's early career and how he transitioned from lighthearted cartoons to gruesome, chilling, and cryptic paintings. This is Sublime Perfected, Goya's Madness and Genius. First, we need to understand Goya a little bit more. He was born in Spain on March 30th, 1746. He is considered a romantic artist. Romantic artists commonly dealt with themes in heroism, rebellion, immense emotions, and the sublime. We will see these themes quite often in Goya's work. Goya did not come from wealth or poverty. He had a rather bland life growing up. His family did not struggle, but they were not living in the lap of luxury either. When he was 13, he began his artistic career. As with most artists, he was forced to just copy other works, but he was able to grow in his talent and he moved on to tapestries. This is the most monotonous part of his artistic career. Goya's cartoon tapestries are of common people and the wealthy. The people in his work were usually doing some type of outdoor activity. There are themes of hunting, bourgeoisie women, children playing, or common people going about their daily lives. These tapestries are meant to be hung in well-to-do people's homes. They are supposed to be pleasant to look at, so there would not be subjects of violence, horror, or anything scary. His clients wanted light-hearted and colorful scenes. While Goya is masterful in his work and did a satisfactory job, it is fluff. There is nothing thought-provoking. It is not Goya at his best. I included these three elongated tapestries, being that they are the ones that I personally am fond of. They remind me of Japanese scroll paintings, or kakemono. They are long, gorgeous scroll paintings that are hung on the wall. These are not the typical shapes of tapestry that he often created, so I appreciate them for their uniqueness. We also need to look at his royal portrait paintings. Goya was the portrait painter for not only wealthy clients, but the Spanish royal family. One of his more well-known portrait paintings was the family of Carlos IV. Carlos IV was considered a bit of a buffoon. In this portrait, many people thought Goya was mocking the family by the way that he painted their facial features. The king has a chubby red face while his wife has a witch's nose with a double chin. He did not seem to flatter the family in any way. While they might not have been their best look, the queen was happy with the portrait. Goya was able to make a decent living from being the royal portrait painter and only grew more in his talent and style. Unfortunately, Goya had fallen gravely ill at 47 years old. After becoming ill, he was permanently deaf. He had a physical and psychological breakdown. It was an even greater struggle during that time when they were not so forward thinking. Having any type of disability or handicap, you were often looked down upon. He also had trouble with his balance and a ringing in his ears. Goya could not hear the world around him. He was not able to properly communicate with those around him. On top of that, there was a nearly constant ringing in his ears. That would drive anyone a little deranged. While Goya did not let this prevent him from working and creating paintings, he struggled with symptoms his entire life. Some art critics think that this was the point where Goya may have lost his mind, while others, one specific art critic named Robert Hughes, believed that this was a breakthrough in Goya's art. Mr. Hughes said, quote, his deafness liberated his art. 
it is possible that it both liberated him and broke him. Maybe he went slightly mad, but at the same time, it set him free. He stopped making portrait paintings of royalty and the bourgeoisie. He was no longer held back by his wealthy clientele. He decided to create whatever he desired. Goya was interested in the macabre, the ominous, and the mystical. On top of Goya dealing with his sickness, he and his wife tried to have anywhere between 5 to 20 children. The specific number is not entirely known. His wife either had miscarriages or her children died very young due to some type of illness. Only one child, a son, survived into adulthood. So not only does he have to manage his disease, but him and his wife are in immeasurable agony because they have lost so many children. A person could easily go mad from the weight and torment of his illness and the heartbreak of losing so many children. After Goya became deaf, he did two series of etchings called The Disasters of War and Los Caprichos. Los Caprichos was a social commentary on Spain and its citizens. He believed his countrymen were stupid, lazy, and focusing less on science and reason and more on superstition. One of the Los Caprichos etchings is called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. It shows a person, perhaps Goya, sleeping at his desk. There are owls raging all around him. An eerie-faced cat glares at the viewer. Goya wrote a caption along with this etching. Imagination, abandoned by reason, produces impossible monsters. United with her, she is the mother of arts and the source of their wonders. Is the man sleeping at his table, Goya, or is he representing all of mankind? When we refuse to take action, when we ignore the evil around us, the monsters take over. Were Goya's monsters taking over? The Disasters of War was a commentary on the wars that Napoleon raged in Spain. Many French soldiers stormed through Spain, killing anyone who got in their way. While it is unsure if Goya witnessed any of these battles, it was something that weighed heavy on him. One particular etching, called Great Heroism with Dead Men, is a gruesome portrayal of the aftermath of war. This is what happens when society drops reason and logic and seeks out revenge with violence. The corpses are mangled and destroyed, strung up on a tree for all to see. Goya believed that humans were no longer thinking and reasoning beings. They were animal-like, seeking revenge through brutality. Later in his life, Goya purchased a house in France called the Quinta del Sordo, or the Deaf Man's House. It was named after the deaf farmer who lived there before Goya. This only further secluded him from the world. He was isolated in his deafness. Now he was detached physically from society. This is a scale model from the History Museum in Madrid just so you can get an idea of the location of this farmhouse. While there are other houses in the vicinity, none are close to Goya. His house seems rather lonesome. Now we have come to the most stirring part of Goya's painting career, the dreaded black paintings. They are named the black paintings for their dark colors and sinister subject matter. These were painted on the walls all over his house. Here is a diagram of the possible locations of each painting in his house. This gives you an idea of Goya's daily life, living in his home with these paintings. It would be terrifying to be walking down a dark hallway in the middle of the night and seeing some of the figures in the work staring at you. Here are some examples of the black paintings that Goya did. Remember that Goya did not give any of these paintings names and he did not title the series. The dog is quite a simple painting of a dog drowning. It is dark, gritty, and just sad. This is the Witch's Sabbath. After Goya went deaf, he depicted quite a few witch-related paintings. Goya was not religious, nor was he an atheist. He was not superstitious either. 
Goya was against the Spanish Inquisition and their brutal rule over Spanish citizens. So the witch's Sabbath, in his own way, is protesting the church's fearful and brutality reign over society. Here is a pilgrimage to San Isidro. Goya did the same subject matter many years ago. It was called the Meadow of San Isidro. In this painting, it is a bright and sunny day. Wealthy people are enjoying the sand and the beach. It was carefree, but now compare it with his black painting. Such a dramatic difference. It is no longer a bright and carefree day at the beach. It is dark, a storm is brewing. It is no longer the bourgeoisie, but peasants. They look as though they are in mourning. Their faces are twisted. There is such a stark distinction between these two works. You can see how much Goya had changed in style and in mood. Now we get to the most disturbing painting in art history, Saturn devouring his son. Saturn's backstory is critical to understand. He was considered the god of melancholy, which fits right in with Goya. Saturn comes from the Greek myth of Kronos the Titan. Kronos was told in a prophecy that one of his children would overtake him and kill him, just as he had done with his father. So any time that he bore a child, he would devour them. In the Greek myth, he would eat them whole and they would stay in his belly. Finally, one of his children named Zeus overpowered him and defeated Kronos. While this story is still scary, it is not so grisly as Goya's painting. Is Goya trying to communicate about the struggle between father and son? He had only one son. Was he concerned with his son overpowering him or not carrying on his legacy as a master painter? Saturn devouring his son is a flawless painting. When you stare at it, you feel the purest form of the sublime. The sublime is the feeling of terror and bliss. We experience this when we stare at something that is both beautiful and dangerous, but we do this from a safe distance. The British philosopher Edmund Burke claimed to be the strongest human emotion possible because it touches on the passions of self-preservation and because it is associated with pain, it has far more effect on us than pleasure. The sublime also brings up the feeling of delight. Burke believed that the sublime was also linked to the void or isolation. These feelings of terror, isolation, and violence are all present in the Saturn devouring his son. You feel the terror of his son being eaten alive. You can hear the crunching of bones and the grinding of teeth. It sends shivers down the spine. Another British philosopher, Immanuel Kant, claimed that the sublime brings associations of destruction, chaos, and violence. Violence over reasons which cannot grasp what it is viewed as the sublime. It goes beyond the boundaries of understanding. Goya's painting certainly invokes violence. There is no reason to Saturn, and there is no reasoning with him to halt on eating his children. It is just unadulterated violence. Goya's colors are dark and muted. The exception is the blood oozing from the wounds of the dead body, which is bright red. We are unsure of Saturn's location. Is he in a cave? Is he outside in the dark? His eyes are wild and maniacal. The hair is tangled and madly flying through the air. His body is hunched over, unable to balance himself from holding on to his limp, lifeless child. Saturn's grip is tight on his son's body, digging his fingers deep into the spine. Why does he hold on so tightly when his son is clearly dead? Saturn is ready to take another chomp out of his son. His mouth is at the elbow. It's as if we had just turned a corner in a cave and caught him in the middle of attacking his son. What adds to the terror of this painting is that it was located in the dining room of Goya's house. Every time Goya sat down to eat a meal, Saturn was there eating with him, staring at one another in the dark. How often would Goya sit with Saturn? Did it give him comfort or did it drive him even more mad? No one really knows the purpose of Saturn devouring his son or any of the black paintings. Only Goya knows. 
Goya painted these works for no one but himself. They were not meant for anyone else to see. What was the purpose of these paintings? Was Goya dealing with his own demons the only way he knew how? Was Goya in control of these demons, or were they controlling him? There are so many unanswered questions to Goya and his black painting series. It's just a part of the mystery that is Goya. An unusual fact that just adds to the madness of this artist is that after he died, he was buried in France. They decided to move his body back to his home country. When they moved the body from France to Spain, his head was stolen. They never found it. So somewhere in the world, someone has the skull of Goya, which maybe he would have preferred it that way, just to keep things interesting, even after death. So after going through Goya's life, was he truly mad? We will never have the accurate answer, but Goya was not completely insane. He did, however, have his own demons to battle. Some demons were stronger than others. We all have our own inner struggles, and that is why people are drawn to Saturn. We can all relate to Goya on some level, to one of his black paintings. Saturn devouring his son is the most sublime painting. It is the perfect form, though there is no viewing the painting at a safe distance. You are not safe from this work, no matter where or how you look at it. The safest way to view the painting is to not view it at all, but where's the fun in that? Thank you.